I was always looking for the way to make people smile. Since we get hungry every day, we have to cook every day. So even though cooking is fun, doing it every day makes it something you got to do. We want to inspire people to enjoy cooking more. Hi, uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I was told they, uh, they always like to have somebody who's really way outside of the community. So that would be me, apparently. My, uh, my phone booth is parked outside. Uh, but I'm here to talk about something uh, that I think you know, readily crosses languages, which is uh, simplicity. And uh, it's something I think is super important and I, I'd like you to try to imagine a different word as the first word in this sentence. Uh, I don't think anything uh, fits better than the word simplicity. So we're going to talk quickly about uh, two words, uh, mostly because they get conflated and we need to stop doing that. So the first word is simple, and what it means is one fold or one braid or twist. And uh, you can contrast this with complex, which means to combine many things or to put together, to braid together things. Um, and we distinguish that from easy, which uh, in the derivation I like, uh, means to lie near. And if you think back when it was hard to travel, having something be nearby made it a lot easier to get, use, uh, whatever, than uh, if you had to travel or um, expend effort to get it. So these are very different things. Uh, when we talk about one fold or braid, we have to move away from actually folding because we don't fold our software. Uh, uh, and we can t look at it in terms of you know, maybe a, a, a piece of software or a component in your software it, it fulfills one role, it has one specific task, it's about a concept like security or scalability or um, access or authorization or um, calculation. Uh, or it has a dimension. Uh, but in particular, I'd want to avoid uh, the word one, you know, getting a fixation on one. Because it doesn't mean that you have only one thing. It doesn't mean you should have um, interfaces or classes or whatever with only one operation, um, or you should only have singletons. Uh, it's really about the interleaving, not the cardinality. And the main thing that distinguishes simplicity from easiness or simple from easy is the fact that simple is objective. We're going to be able to look and we're going to look later in this talk at very specific things we do in software and think about how they may be twisted together. Um, and it's something you can go and you can look at, but there's nothing subjective about it. Uh, and now we have easy, right? And so again, we have to make this translation. What does it mean to be near? It doesn't mean you know, this, this, uh, this library is easy because I don't have to hop on my horse in order to get it. Um, so we can talk about nearness in the same kind of physical sense, and that means is it part of my toolkit? You know, do I normally have it installed? Is it part of the toolkits of people that I work with in general? Um, is it at hand? Um, and then there's this other notion of being nearby, which is, is it familiar to me? Is this something that I already know? Or does it look similar to something that I already know? Uh, is it just a slight variation on something that I already know? Um, that makes it easy, right? Because I can say, oh, I, I get that. That's just like what I know plus one little difference. And so that makes it easy. Um, there's a third characteristic of something being nearby in this kind of sense, uh, which is actually much harder to make happen and much, uh, uh, much more important, which is that the thing that you're doing is actually near your capabilities. Right? You can have something installed. I can install, you know, uh, something really complex and uh, not understand it, but it, you know it's nearby. Uh, it may even look, you know, it may look exactly like something I know, but it may do something completely different. Again, that's going to make it hard. Uh, but most most difficult are things that are 
that are complex, which means they're going to tax our brains in trying to um, manipulate them. In other words, it's outside of our mental capacity. And we never talk about this because it's embarrassing to us, right? We are in the mental uh, work field, right? The work we do is about thinking. And so we'd hate to say, ooh, you know, this is, this is too hard for me to think about. Uh, but it ends up we're all sort of in the same boat in terms of how, how much complexity we can take on. Uh, and, and we need to be frank about the fact that there's a limit to that. Um, but if it's actually far away from our capabilities, it's never going to become easy. And yet, it may be something we have to accomplish. So what are we going to do about that? And the other thing about easiness and the big difference between it and simplicity is that it's relative, right? Something is hard for me because of where I come from or what I already know. Something is familiar to you because of where you come from or what you already know. There's always going to be a relative aspect to something being easy. Um, things that are hard for me may be easy for someone else. Uh, so we get back to this notion of that third part, right? What, what makes something hard for us to understand? And we start with just basic limits, right? Everybody's heard the seven plus or minus two limit of the number of things you can keep in your head. And it's actually quite analogous to juggling limits I mean, in terms of the actual count of things that you can manipulate. Although, of course, I said you know, when I gave a similar talk to this once that you know, our max is 12. Somebody said, I, I saw Cirque du Soleil and somebody could you know, juggle 21 balls. And you know, of course, if he can code, you should hire him, right? That's awesome. Uh, but we really can only think about a couple of things at a time. And the main problem we have with things that aren't simple, right, because we're going to say they're complex, they've been twisted together, is as, as, as soon as you've twisted something together, when it comes time for you to think about it, right, I have to either enhance this part of my system, I have to combine it with something else, I have to fix a problem in it. If I have to pull, if I, if I pull on that thing I'm trying to change, and I get this knot of other stuff that's connected to it, I have to load all of that stuff up in order to think about it, in order to try to solve my problem or enhance my software. Um, because I have to consider all those things together. So complexity, this, this tying of things together, uh, is going to fundamentally uh, undermine our ability to understand things. And if we don't understand them, how can we really effectively change them or fix them or make them better? Uh, so change is really the operative word. I mean, I think we all start our projects, you know, maybe they're mostly startups or greenfield or whatever. It's a beautiful day. We've got our first stand-up. We've got our methodologies or our, you know, uh, manifestos or practices we want to use. We have a great idea. We've got the client involved. We're, you know, everything's great um, the first week. And then the second week, third week, fourth week. And as we keep working, what happens is this, there's a new participant in our stand-up. It's growing in the corner of the room. It's this elephant. It's called the software we've already written. The elephant of the software we've already written is actually going to completely dominate what we do. So we're, you know, we're asked to do more, right? We started, we had you know, do something. OK, that first iteration is a breeze, right? We can do something. But as we move forward, we have to take what we already have and make it, that elephant, do more. Make it do it differently. Make it do things better. Um, and as we try to take on manipulating our software in order to have it do new things, we're going to be challenged to understand it uh, in order to make that happen. And I'll contend that um, we're completely going to be dominated at this point. Once your software is, is of a certain size, you'll be dominated by complexity. I don't care what processes you're using. I don't care how well you test or anything else. Complexity, that elephant, is going to dominate what you can do. And uh, you want to try to reduce the complexity of the software that you have so that you can do more. You, you know, all those other techniques and, and processes are all great, and they're, they're important. Um, but this dominates. And people, you know, even people with the, the best practices will talk about you know, sort of running into a concrete wall in terms of what they could accomplish each week or each, each iteration. And it's this that's really stopping them. From, from either innovating or, or, uh, or changing. But I don't want to uh, characterize um, simplicity as only sort of a defensive mechanism, something that you only use in order to, you know, to stave off the complexity elephant. Um, I, I believe that simplicity really buys you opportunity in, in your designs. And in fact, I will contend that architectural agility 
That is to say, the agility you get from having built a system that's fundamentally simple dominates all other kinds of agility. It doesn't matter what kind of process you have, right? If, if you've got the complexity elephant over there, you're applying the process to like pushing an elephant. Right? And you, I mean, how good can you get at it? Uh, only so good. But if you built a simpler system, uh, what you'll find is that you're, you are going to be able to make it do different things. And um, so, you know, the word architecture is like, oh, you know, we don't do that anymore, right? That was like the 90s when we did architecture. Uh, but, you know, if you don't do this, you're wasting an enormous amount of time. Uh, and, and I think it's because we've sort of demonized design. And I'm not talking about the way things look. I'm talking about the way things work. Uh, because uh, we tend to think of design as making grand plans for how everything's going to go. That is not actually what good design is about. Good design is about taking things apart. Right? Most of what a good designer does is say, ugh, that is like too much is going on in that. Let's pull that into two separate things. A good designer intuitively does that. Design is about taking things apart. Um, once you've done this, I think it brings genuine opportunities for change, right? If you've taken everything apart and you've got simple components, if you want to make them, if you want to use them in another context, that's easier because you don't have to drag something else along with it. If you want to take something that you were doing and say, I'd rather do it a different way, that's also easy, right? Again, simplicity is buying us easiness. It's buying us ease. It's buying us agility, right? If we've made a simple system, it will be straightforward to substitute another part. It will be straightforward to take part of our system and say, you know what? We should run on a different box or a different set of boxes, or a different hosting service, or just completely change the location characteristics of the software we make. Because we can, because we're not trying to drag an elephant around. Ditto with combining different parts for different problems, right? We built all these parts, now we have a new problem. Oh, two of those parts and one new thing solves that problem. Uh, this is what happens for you when you have simplicity-based designs. Uh, so I would, I would say pursuing simplicity is really about pursuing opportunities. Uh, this is an old dig. Uh, don't really need to explain it, because I'd like to just modernize it. It has nothing to do with Lisp. Um, it's really this. Right? We are so fixated with ourselves and the, our own ease of development. Like, I want to sit here, I want to push a button, and everything just happens. And then this thing comes down from the internet. And you know, I'm in my comfy chair, and I've got like 3D visor on. And, uh, and then we look at like technologies or libraries or tools that we want to adopt. And again, it's like, ooh, look, a benefit. Like, I could do this in like 10 seconds faster if I had used this. Or you know, somebody said this you know, has this great characteristic. We don't really look at what we're getting uh, along with that. And uh, so I think we're very self-focused. You know, we have like a culture culture now. We have a meta culture. We're like so infatuated with ourselves. Uh, but we really should be thinking about our software because that's what we actually do. Um, so take the Foo Fighters. Uh, imagine if the Foo Fighters really were mostly concerned about how hard it was for themselves, right? They're like, oh, you know, I, I don't want to learn the drums or the guitar, the strings, they hurt my fingers, you know, this. I want, I want something that's easy, you know, that's not really far from what I know because I don't know how to play guitar yet. And so instead of the Foo Fighters, they became the Kazoo Fighters, <laughs> right? So there's two problems with this, right? One, who wants to listen to that? Right? It's like the Easy Bake Oven. This is, this is not going to produce a good result. The other thing, which I think is more a question to ask yourselves, who wants to be in that band? Who wants to be in the band that consistently chooses the easiest possible thing? Do you want to be in this band? I don't. So there's a certain conflict between programmers and programs. There need not be, but there is. Right? Currently, I think we focus on ourselves. We focus on our own convenience. We do this actually to our own tremendous uh, detriment because our employers leverage the fact that we love homogeneity and we love familiarity and we're all trying to be in the same room, doing the same thing, in the same culture, you know, just vibing on our similarity. Because that means they can replace us easily. 
right? They don't want a plethora of programming languages and all different kinds of techniques and tools and ways of thinking about things. They want one, because the, if they have one, they can replace you. So be careful what you wish for, right? Versus the programs, right? What should, we really, what should we really be focusing on? We should be focusing on what we're making. Why are we making it if we're not gonna focus on it? Right? We could be all happy doing other things like drinking margaritas by the pool. That's not a job, right? That's not a productive, you know, that's not being a productive member of society. We make things. We should care about what we're making and how they come out. Um, so we should focus instead on the quality of the software, its correctness, our ability to change it, maintain it, and things like that. Uh, and we should be careful when we're choosing things that we want to do that we're not looking at something and saying, I like this because it's good for me personally um, right now. Uh, because, you know, some things are really easy, right? Jam install some hairball, right? It's, it's that far away. The complexity is like so simple to get. Just grab something off the internet and, well, you're good for the moment. Uh, but what's going to happen later with your program? So I think hairball is really a good, uh, a good analogy because it, it, it what, you know, what is a hairball? It's a bunch of hair. It's all mangled together. It really does touch this, this fundamental notion, uh, which uh, this great word, complex, labels. It means to interleave or entwine or braid, right? I love this word. We should say to other people when they're ruining our software with a bad design decision, you are, you're complexing things right now. Right? Because braiding, you're braiding, it's like, it's kind of, it's not, it doesn't really work. But complecting works because you know it's bad. Right? It just sounds bad. They complected my thing. I was, went on vacation, I came back, and it was all complected with this other thing. <laughs> um, so you don't want to do this. Right? This is where complexity comes from. The word comes from this. The, the result comes from this activity taking more than one thing and tying them together in a little knot, however easy it may have made something, um, or maybe it, you didn't do it really thinking, you just didn't think about simplicity, you just ended up with this, um, is where complexity comes from. And the more you do of it, the more difficult it will be for you to make good software that's reliable and software that you can change and enhance. Uh, so this is really what you're trying to avoid. And, and in order to avoid it, you have to develop sens sensibilities about how to detect when it's going on. Uh, so how do, we make, how do we make things easy? Right? Because I'm not saying easy is bad. I'm saying two parts of easy are really straightforward. Right? If you wanted to make something near, like in your toolkit, you know, just choose to use it. You want to start using a new thing that's novel? I mean, you do have to get over the fact that it may not be something you've used before, it may not be in your tool set, it may be not what your friends use or your company has approved for use yet. But you can do that, you can get it. The other thing you can do is you can become familiar with it, right? You can learn about new things, you can read books, right? If, you've, if you want everything to be familiar, you'll never learn anything new. You have to break out of that. Uh, but you can do that, that's all in your own control. But what about this last one, right? What if you really have a hard thing to tackle? Can you get smarter? You know, is it like, get smarter for dummies? Get smarter in 24 days, 24 hours, two weeks? No, we can't really get a lot smarter. And we're not very much smarter or dumber than each other. We're all smart. Uh, so if we're gonna, if we're gonna uh, tackle something more complex, either because we want to do something uh, that's more sophisticated for our users, we wanna you know, write more interesting software, solve harder problems, uh, we need to move them towards us. They have the inherent complexity, complexity that they have. We need to move them closer to us by making sure our implementation of them is as simple as possible, right? And that's the key. We really, I really do want things to be easy, but I want them to be easy in all three senses. If you only focus on the first two, you're gonna end up with complexity because you're gonna have that third one uh, coming from the side. So this is the basic fact of this talk. Right? We can make the same exact software we're making today with dramatically simpler stuff. Dramatically simpler languages, tools, techniques, approaches. Like really radically simpler. Radically simpler than Ruby, which seems really simple. Um, why aren't we? 
So let's look at um, some of these things. I'm not in this talk going to uh, break all these down. So we have a bunch of choices that we make, right? We can write stateful programs that are based around objects, uh, when instead we could have written a program that mostly manipulates values and occasionally has state. We should. Um, we use stateful methods when we could just have an ordinary function. An ordinary function is much, much simpler in the sense I'm talking about than a method. It's, and it's therefore easier to test, easier to understand, easier to maintain, easier to combine with other things. Um, variables uh, are things that are very complex and should be avoided as much as possible. You may or may not have choices in the language that you use. Um, every time you inherit, every time you write a, an involved switch statement or use pattern matching, um, instead of a, a polymorphism construct, uh, you're adding complexity to your system. This one is particularly interesting, syntax. Syntax is inherently complex because the word syntax means um, associating meaning with uh, order, with position. Right? That's what it means to have a syntax. So the, you know, when we write DSLs and things like that, we have to think about the fact that we're adding complexity. We might choose to, but we should know that that's what we're doing. Um, looping, right, we know, is, is, uh, is, a, is a form of complexity because it's complexing you know, uh, a variable with the work to do. And like, it's nice in, in Ruby you have like each, right, which is a higher level construct that gets you out of the looping game. I'm not going to talk about these. The, you know, ORM is one of the most complex things you could ever touch. And we choose it over and over and over again without thinking at all because everybody's doing it. It is really complex. You waste an inordinate amount of your time on this. And you need to look at it. Uh, conditionals are things we might be able to replace with rules. And then you, know, you can look at some of the you know, cool new database technology that has eventual consistency. Eventual consistency is incredibly complex. It's very, very difficult to think about. Um, so don't choose it unless you really have to. I really don't know what to say about this. Right? This is wrong. Right? We know this is wrong. Why? Because right? it says simplicity is about you. Well, we know simplicity is not about you, right? Simplicity is about how twisted up is the thing that you're making. It has nothing to do with you, right? And, I mean, it, reducing the amount of work to be done. Gem install hairball reduces the amount of work to be done, like, for the moment, right? I didn't have to write whatever the hairball does. I now have a hairball that does it for me, right? But the, I don't think, I mean, you guys invent gems pretty quickly, but I don't think there's a gem oh my God, please take all instances of this hairball out of my project, what were we thinking, right? Although I don't know. There are a lot of gems out there, so no, some were really powerful, <laughs> right? So it's, it's really wrong and it's terrible advice, absolutely terrible advice, right? Simplicity is not about you and simplicity is hard work. It is actually work to do the job of simplifying things. But there's a huge payoff. The person who has a genuinely simpler system, a system made out of genuinely simple parts, is going to be able to affect the greatest change with the least work. He's going to kick your ass. Right? He's never going to gem install a hairball. He's going to spend more time uh, simplifying things up front. And in the long haul, he's going to wipe the plate with you because uh, he or she. Uh, because they'll have that ability to change things when you're struggling to push elephants around. This is a much nicer uh, thought about simplicity, right? It's not an objective, necessarily. It falls out of trying to pull things apart into their essential natures. Right? What does it mean to be an essential thing? So I want to end this talk with two examples of, of the way to think about simplicity in context, because um, I think, I think it, it's important to think that this way. So one is lists and order. Right, the list and order problem. Is there a problem? We all know what lists are, right? They're a sequence of things. But when you see a list of things, you're automatically uh, confronted with a, a, a question, right? Does the order in this list matter? Is it a list of things that are all semantically the same? Or is it a list that's acting sort of like as a tuple of three different things, right? The first one here, they're all sort of homogenous. And the second one, it's depth with height. It's sort of forming a little you know, st structure with semantics. And the problem is if you started to use that in another part of your program, you'd be like, what was first? Was it width or de depth with height or width depth? You, know, you see this problem, right? If order matters, complexity has been introduced into the system. 
And of course, if you have something like sets in your language, you can properly call out the fact order does not matter. And by the way, there are no duplicates. So prefer that if you can. Why should you care about order? It's a source of complexity, right? It complex each thing with the next. Well, when do you see like the negative aspects of that? Anytime you use it, right? Every usage point that you do um, will, will, be inflected this, will be infected this way because you see this when you try to change your program. Imagine if you said, we're going to write this part of our program, we're going to pass a list with name and email around. And you wrote a whole bunch of software um, that you know, leveraged that fact. And then you said, ah, we need to enhance the software, we need to put phone in there. I want to stick phone in the middle. You know, you know what happens. I don't care how fancy your IDEs are, refactoring or whatever. This is a source of bugs and problems. It's really difficult to do because it's in essentially complex. And of course, everybody I think is sitting here saying, you know, we don't do that, right? We have associative data structures. We would never do that. I mean, it's actually a language feature of some languages to make tuples like that. You know, they're called product types. Uh, doesn't seem like a feature to me. But this. You know, even if you don't do this, right, this fundamental problem of order, it's there. It's all over what we do. Because as a concept, you can lift it out of this context and see where it comes up. For instance, positional arguments to functions are an example of this problem, right? If you wanted to add a different argument in the middle, you would have the same problem everywhere, right? And there's a way to avoid that. You could use named arguments or a map. Now, I'm not saying every language should have um, keyword-based parameter calling. I mean, Clojure has positional arguments, but you have to know when you're choosing something like that that you are accepting some complexity here. Hopefully, you know, you're making a trade-off there for some um, concision, right? Uh, syntax I talked about uh, being essentially complex. If you can use ordinary data structures to describe uh, what you want to convey, you're much better off than introducing syntax. So again, you have to think about it. Those other things were product types. We know we could use maps or hashes to do that. Any kind of an imperative program will be trumped by a declarative program in terms of being simpler and not having order problems, right? Take an imperative program that says, set this thing to that, set that to this, take that other thing, and now do this, and like change the order of the statements, right? It's now broken. You know, take a SQL program and change the order. It's not broken. Of course, it may be slower, and that's a different problem. Prolog has this problem versus data log. Another interesting thing we see in our programs all the time, just call, you know, calls of, uh, uh, that are chained together. A calls B calls C calls D. That is an ordered list where the order matters. Right? That system is going to be harder to change than one that says A takes whatever it created and puts it in a queue, and B reads from that queue. Because if I want to change that program, I have an easy time of it. Right? I don't need to touch A. I can make somebody else start consuming that queue. And A is unaffected. It doesn't mean you have to put queues between everybody, but as an architectural construct that reduces complexity, queues are really important. XML is a great example of this. XML was designed to support text files where order does matter, right? You can't change the order of sentences and have them mean the same thing, right? But is that what we should be using for our data? Are the parsers that work with XML really good for data? No, they're terrible. Right? And I think that's why everybody says, oh, JSON because it's simpler, it doesn't have angle brackets because they're like edgy or ugly or something. It's not. I think intuitively people are choosing things like JSON or closure literals over XML because when they have a, a map, it's a map. It says it's a map. It's inherently a map. When you read into your program, it's not going to be like, ooh, but, you know, did the order matter? Would there be more than one? You know, all this questioning. Right? Because the, it's on the tin. It says what it is. These are maps, these are lists, it's data. It's a data describing protocol that doesn't have any order stuff in it. It means the parses are simpler and everything else. And there's more. So look for the order program, uh, problem in your own programs. How do you solve this? Just use maps, or you call them hashes, right? Use them all the time. Just choose to use them. First class associative data structures rule. Right? You want to use a language that has idiomatic support for them, and I'm preaching to the crowd here. right? We, we all have this. Uh, but people that don't really suffer. Um, you want to leverage the fact that you can do generic manipulation of these things. So choose and use this data structure often. All right, second problem I want to take on, the information problem. Actually, it's the information non-problem, right? Information is simple. This is a problem we create for ourselves, right? Because we ruin it. 
We wrap it up in stupid classes that accomplish nothing, right? You'd be much better off 90% of the time you use classes to do data things, to just use a hash instead. You'd be much, much better off. Your system would be simpler. You could write generic data processing utilities that didn't have to know about your class or what you called your get whatever thingy. You could just use it like it, like it is. It actually is an associative piece of information. Right? I have a name and I have an address. I have a, that's, it's, it is actually just a simple piece of information. Don't put stuff on top of it. When you do that, you end up with a bunch of problems. Tying yourself to representation things, losing the ability to manipulate things generically, marrying your representation and class names du jour instead of saying, I know how to process maps or hashes and that's what I'll do. One of the reasons why people choose this frequently, or excuses, is I want to encapsulate things, right? Encapsulation is for implementation details and information doesn't have implementation. Right? Until you add some gook or some verbs to a piece of information, it doesn't have any implementation. There's nothing to hide, right? Because you're not going to change this aspect of it. All information that anybody's going to actually touch or use has to have some representation. I don't care if it's directly accessible through the map or return values and arguments to your accessors, right? You're going to have to expose some representation. So you're not actually getting out of that by encapsulating. You're not actually doing any encapsulation. So uh, what happens when we wrap information? This is an example from a language that has semicolons. But you know, you create this class that has the information in it and some verbs. And then you write services that consume it. Right? What happened to you? Well, how can you tell? Again, we want to see what kind of problem this, did this create for me? You can answer that problem by looking and asking this question. Can you move it? Right? Can I take this thing that I was doing this way? Can I move it? Make it a service that something could call. Can you take the subsystem and move it around? Um, I saw somebody who was advocating, you know, people start designing their systems as systems of, as, as systems of systems right from the get-go. Like, make it into six services in the very first iteration. And I said to that person, I said, wow, that seems like a lot of forethought. Why can't people morph from a, a system of components to a system of systems? And he said, you know what? because of their languages and the way they use them. And it was really a telling, uh, a telling thought. It is the case that we fail to do this um, because we send these verb-oriented things around. Right? What do we want out of something that's going to become a subsystem? We want it to have a well-defined boundary. We want to abstract away the operation. So the service has the verbs. right? But, and we have to do something about error handling. But the biggest point is we want to take and return data. Right? We, don't, we don't have the same problem. We build these, these object-y, verb -y things in our programs, but as soon as somebody says, it should be on another server, we immediately stop doing that style of programming. Why do we do that? Right? We immediately say, it's going to be RESTful, it's going to pass data, it's going to return data structures, we're going to use JSON. All these great ideas are good over here. What, why are they not good inside your program? In fact, they are good inside your program. You're not doing them because of conventions that you know, you've absorbed from using object orientation. This is really better. And if you took this approach here, moving this to there would be straightforward because you would have been programming with data all along. So again, of those problems we saw before, most of them would be solved just by using maps or hashes up front. So to wrap up, um, simplicity is definitely a choice. This is not something that will ever fall out of tooling or practice or anything else. You, you really need to do this work. This is the most important work that we do because doing this work makes everything else we do substantially and deeply easier. Uh, you have to get some sensibilities around it and thinking about things like the order problem or am I wrapping information are the ways you get good at simplifying things. You have to s separate simplicity and ease Right? Get some sensibilities around entanglement. Try to find entanglement. Try to have conversations about entanglement. Try to take part of your stand-up and say, did we entangle anything? Did we complex anything yesterday? Is this next thing we're trying to do complexing what we already have? Take a moment to have that conversation, and now I hope you have some language to use for that. Don't lean on your tools. They, they don't actually do this part of the job. They have other attributes. But they do not do this. They do not do this. They don't care. 
Right? So you need to choose simple things up front. There's a lot of not simple, simple things in your language. You need to not choose them unless there's really a good reason. So I think this really matters. I think it solves two fundamental problems that we, we all encounter every day. The first is we need to deal with complexity. We need to keep it at a minimum. And um, the only way to do that is by making things simpler. It's sort of obvious. The other thing, though, is this opportunity part, right? Simplicity enables change, right? I think it's the primary source of real agility. Agility means to do something. It doesn't mean to do it over. It doesn't mean to redo it. It doesn't mean to undo it. It means to do it. It means I'm here, and I'm going to go there, you know? I, I'm not going to, you know, un take everything apart or throw it away and then do this next thing. I'm going to move from here to there. I'm going to directly do. That's agility. Right? And if you're dragging an elephant around, you're never going to be agile. Um, so that's it. Please go make some simple things.